Okay, so, um, this is the timetable for today. We've got a long session again to begin with, 9.30 to 11, uh, where I'm going to be talking about uh, the model view controller design pattern. And then uh, Mark Elvigo is going to be talking about uh, JPC. We've got a bit of a, um, a theme today in terms of looking at uh, software design, uh, software design patterns. Uh, so that's, I'm going to be giving an overview of MVC, model view controller, which is um, obviously an important uh, design pattern in uh, web applications. And uh, Mark Hell's going to be talking about the appropriate design patterns to use when interacting with in databases. Following on from that, we have got our session with ThoughtWorks, where they're going to be uh, giving us a um, sort of workshop set up. Uh, some uh, practice uh, in agile practices in the context of web development. And then we have a free lunch, which can't be bad, uh, which you were invited to attend. So that's going to be in here. Uh, so that's going to be from 12.30 to 1.30. Then after that, we've got uh, introduction to the laboratory exercises for this afternoon. So that's going to be the application of uh, MVC and JDBC. So you're going to get some hands on experience of doing that both in the session, the uh, first lecture session in the afternoon, and obviously in the labs later on. Now the other thing is, the, we've got our first demonstration in the labs this afternoon, so the first exercise is being assessed, dictionary zero. So if you haven't done so already, um, can you make sure that you uh, submit that to Blackboard, so you have until 5 o'clock to do that, you'd like to do it as soon as possible, or preferably before it's marked. The reason for this is not so that we can mark your work offline, because we're not going to be doing that. It's all going to be marked by demonstration. The reason for this is because partly because students want it for moderation, so it's a good way of keeping everything together, but also um, so that you have uh, easy access to marks and also it's just some written feedback as well. We should give you some verbal feedback during the demonstration, um, but we've got a, a two and a half hour lab session. There'll be an opportunity if you need it to get. Um, feedback on any problems we have with the lab, you know, how you can do better next time, um, and we're going to be put inputting that into Blackboard as well, so you'll be able to access those comments through Blackboard. So hopefully that's a helpful thing. So I know there's some confusion about this last week, but I think that's going to be clear now. Okay, right, let's get on. Model View Controller, MVC. Uh, the subtitle of this uh, is, what can it do for me? So I think it's quite easy when you're talking about the MVC design pattern, we need software architecture, slightly different things. Uh, so get bogged down in the semantics. It's very easy to kind of worry about you know, um, how exactly it should be applied in a, in a pure form. And, and that's not always the most helpful way of looking at it from a software development perspective. So hopefully by the end of the lecture, we'll have a good idea of um, how the model view controller paradigm is useful in web application development um, and how you should think about using it yourself. I'm going to briefly describe the origins and the history of MVC because I think it's sort of helpful to know where it's come from. What goes where? So then we're going to be talking about what parts of your application, what parts of your code might go in the model, what parts might go in the view, and what parts might go in the controller, and how those map. Then we'll talk about how they will talk to each other. So. How should uh, the model and the view and the controller interact with each other? How should they interface, communicate? And finally, most importantly, let's talk about why it's useful. I mean, hopefully that's going to come out over the course of the lecture, so it's not just going to be uh, something that we dip into at the end. Okay, um, it's not a long time period. That was invented by Trigve Rainskull. There's no one from Norwegian in the audience. I don't know whether I said that correctly. I think that's how I was supposed to say this anyway. Uh, it started life not um, as a uh, software architecture, but um, basically as a set of design metaphors uh, that uh, Rayscale um, thought would be useful for um, applying to the design planning of complex construction projects. So that's kind of where it comes from. Um, and he started thinking about this in 1973, and in fact, um, later on, at the end of the slides for some links to the original papers and stuff, so you can have a look at those, they're quite interesting to me. Uh, in 1979 it was uh, um, applied to the Smalltalk uh, 80 language, so it was uh, written into the class library there, 
as an architecture for, specifically for GUI applications. And in fact, it wasn't Rainsco who did this, it was one of his colleagues at Xerox Park, which is where this all happened. Um, Jim Atoll, I think it was. But, uh, that's when uh, it became, so the papers have been written about this, and this is kind of the original software architecture paper. And again, this is a very accessible paper, so um, I recommend reading that if you're interested in knowing more. So the idea of the pattern is to decouple data access and business logic, it's the very model, from their presentation to the user. Okay, so the model is responsible for um, managing um, its state, uh, managing the data that it contains, and the view is responsible for presenting part of the model to the user at any one time. Now, I'm not sure that's a brilliant, um, <laughs> a brilliant image to use for the controller, because it's not really a controller. The controller is responsible for managing user input and routing that to the appropriate part of the model. So the model um, receives instructions from the controller and it may also uh, receive, um, it, it may also be contacted, I suppose, by the view um, in order to update what's shown in the view. We'll talk a little bit more about how these fit together. In the model data. We have operations on data. We have um, rules governing access to and updates of data. Now, is this making sense for everybody? Yeah? What happens in the model? The model is basically like, it's like your application, it sort of is your application. And the view and the controller are ways of interfacing with it from the outside, as it were. Okay, view. This is something that's uh, relatively tangible, I, I think. It's a representation, a visual representation, usually, but it doesn't have to be, um, of part of the model. And it specifies how the model should be presented. So the view code is look at part of the model and specify how it should be presented to the user. So a couple of ways this can happen. Uh, the data from the model can get to the view. So the push model, the view listens for change notifications from the model. And we'll also see later on that the controller can uh, direct the view as well. This is in terms of the, the data, the state of the model. So the view can listen for changes. Alternatively, the view can uh, call the model to uh, get its most recent state, retrieve its current state, and that's the call model. <coughs> Does that make sense? Okay, what happens in the controller? responsible for dealing with user input. So this uh, translates uh, user input actions uh, into actions for the model. It routes requests, so it takes a request and sends it to the appropriate parts. And it may also select a new view. So it may also tell the uh, view uh, what to display next. That, so Again, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll look at how these things interface a little bit later on, but that's one of, the, one of the other things that it might do. So let's sort of clarify how this applies to web applications, because you know, this originally applied to GUI applications. What does it mean for web applications? And before we go any further, actually, I just want to ask at this point, um, how many people in here are really sort of very fay with MVC, very happy with it, and how it should be applied to software design. Okay, yeah, we've got a few people here. Um, and how many people have heard about, mm, no, no, I've heard of it, but I'm not too sure. A few more. And how many people have, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. 
to be honest with you, I think actually if you're not familiar with this paradigm, it doesn't necessarily put you at a disadvantage. It can often be more difficult uh, to, if you have a preconception which um, is a bit fuzzy, it can be more difficult to, to get rid of that. So I think actually if you haven't heard of it before, it's not really a problem. Okay, so as some of you may have spotted, MBC is about separating concerns. It's an application of the separation of concerns. And in particular, we've got the dialogue with the clients, which is the front end of our application. And then we've got the internal data operations, which is the back end of the application. So hopefully that makes sense for everyone. We can also see a really nice map into the HTTP uh, induced life cycle. Get and validate request for the first stage. What would that map to? Control. What we've been talking about so far. Mm -hmm. yeah. Execute the request internally. Where does that what does that map to? Which part does that map to? On the public. Yeah. And compose and return the response. Which one's left? Are on the left hand side. And that sends a request to the controller. The controller then says, okay, I'm going to work out what to do with this, and I'm going to contact the model with these parameters to tell the model what to do. So the model does its stuff. It may notify the controller when it's finished by broadcasting a message. At that point, the controller gets the chat through the view, and the controller says, okay, um, I also know from this HTTP request that what we want to do is uh, display this page next. So, the view knows which internet page it's going to be using. And finally, uh, the view says, okay, I know which template I'm going to be using, but I need to know what content to put in there. So, I'm going to get the data from the body. So, the view contacts the model to get the data. And finally, of course, this is all displayed in the browser again. Does anyone have any issues with that? Is that all making sense? Anyone disagree with that way of doing things? I'm quite, if, feel free to shout out, by the way, if there's anything that, is, that isn't clear, because I think it can be a bit Okay, let's look at it another way. So that's not the only way. <coughs> so in this uh, particular diagram, we're going to have our request starting in the view. So the input goes into the view, and the view says, okay, we've got this request, uh, I'm going to send it off to the controller, and the controller can work out what to do with it. So the controller contacts the model again, we'll just send some uh, data back, and the controller then sends a new direction to the view. Now, in fact, in some software architecture, this is where it finishes. So the controller does all of the mediation between the model and the view. But of course, that, that may not happen. It may be that the view is registered with the model, so receives notifications about when it changes. Uh, or it may be that it contacts the model and then receives some data back from it about its current state. So there's flexibility within the system. No one way that you have to do things. It, it kind of seems for web applications that you've got that model both client side and server side. What type of view? Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's so can be. Yes, that's true, that's true. So obviously you can think about it as a as a kind of overall software architecture, but also you've got the design pattern that can go through the client side and the server side. So have you had experiences of using that? Using the paradigm yourself? And they're still using not technologies in this, that not, in, not in this technology. No. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point. So <coughs> obviously we're kind of talking about this as, as an overall, this is how you might view the entire application. But in fact there are lots of lots of subsets of the pattern um, applied throughout the uh, throughout the application. 
So actually looking at this and, and going back to what you were saying, so if we're talking about sort of client and server side code, so you've made the point it could be could be either. Um, if we're viewing this as our overall application, um, which of these bits would go in the server? Which server side code? Yeah. I think definitely the model. Yeah. And most of the controller. I think. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. What's about the view? Do you think any of that would go in there? Uh, well, the view, of course, should be on the client. I don't know. Sometimes actually they have to be shared on both on the console and um, client and server. It depends on how you deploy these things. Yeah, absolutely. That's very, very true. So I mean in fact you you may have um, obviously some of the view on the client side. Um, you may have the view on the, the server side as well, but you code on the server side too probably in order to do things like uh, create the pages to begin with. Um, but of course yes, uh, any client side script it would be in the view block. But like you say, it's um, it's it's not hard and fast. It's not fixed the way that you, you set these things up. Right, so we, <laughs> we talked about a couple of ways that, that uh, the model, the view, and the controller can interface. Um, in fact, there are lots and lots of ways. Um, these are just a few of them, chosen for no particular reason other than they're all slightly different. Uh, so I think it's important to make this point that um, there are um, lots of different ways that you can apply this, and it's it's not necessarily the case that that one is better than the other, or that one size fits all. So just thinking again about uh, the application to web applications in particular, why is it useful to use this particular paradigm, kind of thinking about our um, application for separating our concerns. So the idea of separating things into the view, the controller, the front end, the back end. How is that particularly useful for web applications? For the user experience. Or Sorry? For the user experience. <coughs> yeah, well, yes, absolutely. So one of the reasons it's useful is because um, you can get people, different developers, so from a, from a kind of practical software engineering perspective, you can have different developers working on the front end and the view code and the back end, and the database access, and the business logic. So obviously, that's really useful, and it may be that uh, developers have different skills, so some will be uh, better at front-end programming and others at back-end programming. So that's, that's a really um, good point. Um, is a web application more likely to have uh, to be able to, to need to change its view than a, another kind of desktop application? Yeah? Yeah, so obviously you, you might have a, a view for a, a particular browser. Uh, you may have to change slightly for different browsers, although hopefully uh, you may, may be using a framework to help you handle that. Um, but obviously if you want a mobile version of the application, that's, that may have to be quite different to the desktop version. So you don't want to be writing an entirely new application for a mobile phone. Well, I know this does happen sometimes. But anyway, that's a good reason to, uh, to think about using this kind of paradigm. Right, so let's think in a little bit more detail about where different parts of our code might go. So let's think about data validation. Now, I think I said in an earlier slide, uh, it talked about uh, the controller uh, getting and validating HTTP requests. So obviously, uh, we can have our validation code in the controller. Should it always go in the controller? How about uh, data sanitization? So this is something we talked about last week. Um, this is uh, where we um, look at the code that uh, the um, input that the user has given us and make sure it's not JavaScript or SQL or something horrible like that that's, that's going to attempt to compromise our program. Where, where, where would you say arguably sanitization code should go? In the client controller. In the controller? Does everybody agree with that? Okay. In the view. Part of the view also. Yeah, yeah, it could be part of the view as well, absolutely, yeah. So it depends how, you, depends how you've got things set up. So in the couple of diagrams we looked at before, we have one where the browser just got in touch with the controller straight away, and that would be an appropriate place, so the, the controller would be an appropriate place to have the sanitization code then. And, and um, obviously in the second one, the view was dealing with user input directly and forwarding that to the controller, so that would be the place where you'd, you'd put your sanitization code. What about user authorization? Where would that go? Yeah. 
we have a set of beams which have all the uh, you know, uh, set of uh, set of classes for the front end display and other you know, uh, yeah. for the data. Yeah. So we we pass back the data. Yeah. So basically, you're applying the paradigm, but within uh, your specific context. Yeah. Okay. In the way that the way that you need to. So this is the thing. It's, it's there are often different ways of applying it, um, but it can be very useful to think about separating your concerns in that way. Um, so sorry, some, somebody else. Was it Spring or Strat? Spring. 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 So it's um, how is uh, MVC applied within Spring? Yeah. Th there is a part of the Spring called the Spring MVC. Right. Uh, which is responsible for handling the uh, MVC pattern, yep. and for the, the for the controller and view, it's somehow the same right. uh, that as you described. But for the act, uh, for the, the model, it's using Hibernate as it's uh, for the managing database. Right. Right. Okay. So, is it with um, something like Spring? Do you have to use MVC? I mean, so with mm -hmm. Ruby, you really pushed into it. I know that other frameworks are a bit more flexible. No, you, you don't have to, but you, have to. but you can you can use the Spring MVC packages. Yeah, and do you do you use them? Do you yeah. find yeah? You see, you find that a useful way of organising things. Yeah. Okay. Is anybody else who has kind of had experience using frameworks? And um, I have used both sides too yeah. with JSP. Yeah. But I didn't like the fact that you had to add JSP code inside the HTML pages. Right. And this is not part of the MVC, but yeah, yeah. if you wouldn't do this, you couldn't work. Right, okay. So this was very bad. Yes. And uh, I also used the uh, Apache that was for the framework, yeah. uh, which was created in order to maximize the MVC pattern. Yes. And you can't put Java code inside the yeah. HTML. Yeah, so which do you prefer? Of course, Apache that's Oh, there you go. So we've got lots of votes here for MVC, so people can use uh, Frameworks that don't do and don't um, implement it, and you find that the MVC version is the yes. is the easier one to use. Okay. Not the easy one, but okay. the, the fact that it doesn't allow you to add Java code inside the HTML, yeah, it maximises the MVC pattern. Yes, yes, yeah. And do you think that's a do you find that's a, um, a better way of organising the software? Yes, because yeah. if you use JSP instructs, you yeah. will have to add Java code, so you can separate the concepts. Yes, yeah. Yeah, okay, no, that's, very, that's a very interesting point. So the thing about uh, frameworks, which I think um, is brought out here, is that uh, they essentially mean you don't, well, depending on the framework, you, you don't have to worry about how you apply MVC because the frameworks do it for you. So it's just one of the points of, of using a framework. Obviously, you give up some flexibility, but they enforce, generally, good software practice. Now, people have their opinions about which ones they like to use and which they don't. But most of the time, um, they massively accelerate the, de the development process because they don't um, require you to think too hard about what you're doing. We're going to require you to think about what you're doing, by the way. Just you know. So we are going to be using a framework later on, but, uh, but it's one which uh, has quite a lot of flexibility in it. Okay, so. It is not the case that you just apply MVC uh, to software architecture necessarily. Um, as we talked earlier on, you can, uh, can subdivide your application and apply MVC perhaps to the client side and perhaps to the server side. Um, you can also apply it to things like user interface development. So this is relatively recent work. This is some research that's being done in our lab at the moment. <coughs> so inside the model of your user interface, you have your data or information and the constraints on that. So when I talk about data, we're talking about things like data types here, what data types are that you're using, and how those data types are constrained and how they can interact. And inside the view, you're basically talking about the structure of the, <coughs> data, the widgets that you're using, different components, user interface components, <coughs> um, and how those all and the controller covers the user interface behavior. So this is basically um, how people interact with the application and how the user interface uh, behaves in response to them. Is this making sense to people or is this not? That, that is more like the smart client using local works like, to, you know, okay. to, to also to increase 
Right, so, so what is it that you're doing in your lips? Large scientific data models, if you like, right, manipulation yeah. and extracting uh, 2D data from 3D or 4D. Yeah. Five data. Yeah. So you do that. It, it, it sounds like it breaks the MVC pattern, but you do that on the local. Yeah. Ah, oh, right, okay. Otherwise, it would take you a long, long time. So. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's interesting, actually. Yeah, so you're applying, it's this kind of way of breaking up the... Yeah. Okay, all right. I did, so I didn't know that it was, uh, uh, was kind of applied directly in that way. I mean, the way that uh, the way that we're looking at this in our lab at the moment is to do with obviously developing user interface as service. This is, this is how you're applying it here. So it's interesting to know about industry applications. Um, and this is to do with uh, the research is to do with trying to understand how to build better uh, user interfaces. Um, and at the moment, uh, our colleague of ours, George Brashnik, is trying to develop a tool that can help tell you how to design your user interface based on the controller, so based on the way that the user interacts with the software. So, it's quite complicated, but there are a few people working in this area at the moment. Right, why, why use MVC? We've touched on a couple of examples already. Okay, so one of the um, obvious reasons is obviously um, it makes it easy, easier to develop your code. So from a software engineering perspective, you can have different people working on different parts of uh, the application, um, and then as long as you define the interface correctly, uh, those, those parts can be encapsulated, and people can do what they're best at doing, hopefully, um, and then you can fit, things, fit the uh, parts together uh, with minimal fuss. See, it also makes it easier to test your application. So um, if you, again, have separated concerns uh, sensibly, possibly according to this paradigm, um, then it means that you can test them in isolation. And again, you shouldn't have too many problems um, with um, faults in one impacting on another. And of course, for that reason, it's easier to maintain as well. Now, these things all apply to MVC, but they just apply to separation of concerns, right? So as long as you separate concerns sensibly, then you should have all of these benefits. So the benefit of MVC in particular is it provides for you as a web application developer a way of managing the complexity. So if you're dealing with a complex application and you're trying to work out how you should separate your concerns sensibly, then applying MVC just gives you a way of, of starting to think about that. So that's the particular benefit of this paradigm. And in fact, of course, you know, with frameworks, uh, they do a lot of that thing for you. So finally, we'll just look at MVC in practice. Um, I've just realised, if you <laughs> can't tell at the moment, but I think this slide looks slightly circular um, when all of the points are written down. So um, we'll, I'll try to make sense of them as we go through. Okay. <coughs> If you're using a framework, you don't have to worry about things like what goes in the model, what goes in the controller, um, what goes in the view, necessarily. A lot of the framework will do that for you, and it'll tell you what to put where. And there'll be some frameworks that will be flexible, and you can kind of decide what you want to, how you want to organise things yourself. Um, but it can take that, to, take that um, issue away from you. And again, it defines how they draw to each other, so most frameworks will start to start find how these things can interact. If you're not using a framework, or you're a particularly bespoke application that you don't think is going to fit well into a framework, uh, then when you start up, they can be the best way to separate concerns. Uh, 
Commissioner Zero the exercise that we've been doing over the last week. It's going to do some applying advocacy of practice. Um, <clears throat> and this, uh, this, this morning, uh, ThoughtWorks are going to be talking, no, they're not going to be talking about MBC, they're going to be talking about quite a different part of software development. Um, but I think it would be interesting when they're talking about the um, agile practices you can use for software development um, and how you might think about things like incremental design, which I think is something you're going to talk about, how that maps to software architecture in the way that we've been thinking about it and how it, how it might map or not the MBC paradigm when you have great concerns. So I think that's something just to think about. Um, as we're going through that session. Right. Um, fortunately, you don't have to uh, listen to me in the rest of the session because Mark is going to uh, talk now about uh, JDBC. Right. <laughs>